Uh, thanks, Lucas. Uh, I guess my job is just to, to wrap everything up, and I'm not going to take much time because I've been looking around the room as the, the seminar has been going on, and I know there's lots of questions. So uh, I want to thank our speakers. I, I think we had a great group here, and, and uh, we, did, we wanted to introduce what we're doing on the, the feed efficiency testing. Uh, let you in on what we're doing. Some of these results are kind of preliminary. Um, the one thing that I've realized is that the more answers we get from it, the more questions I actually have. And uh, I guess uh, part of my job is I, I'm the seed stock manager, but a big part of it is, is customer service. And I'm going to keep answer, asking those questions and asking those questions until they get it through my head and then I'll be able to maybe interpret it to, to everybody else. So um, one, uh, one of the things that, uh, that I did want to want to stress is, is it is fairly new. Um, it's listed on the on the bottom of the third page of the supplement sheet. Um, we've got the RFI data, the feed to gain, the feed to gain EPD, average daily gain, and then the index that Dr. Spangler did for us. I encourage everybody to read the, the definition to the feed efficiency index. Um, I think it does kind of clear it up a little bit. Um, and I encourage everybody to look at the numbers. But the one thing I want to stress is, is not to put just too much weight on these numbers. Um, they're just another tool for us to use. Um, you hear that all the time about EPDs and, and everything else. I mean, the cattle still have to fit what you're, what you're doing. Um, I was talking to Mike Hall yesterday, and, and uh, he was telling me about how when they started using pelvic measurements 30 years ago or 25 years ago, all of a sudden they noticed that they were actually discounting bulls with smaller pelvic measurements because people started putting all this weight on, on pelvic measurements because it was the newest tool available and, and uh, they weren't taking everything into consideration. So I encourage everybody to keep, uh, keep looking at, at all the data and make sure that uh, you know, what you're buying fits your program. Um, and again, I just want to stress that one of the main reasons for us doing this is, uh, again, customer service. We want to make our, our product more valuable to you and uh, our partners and so that we can all be more successful in the, in the beef business in the long term. Okay, the, uh, the question is uh, when Allison was talking about the spraying of the calves and different things that they're doing with the system, I, I actually want to put a little plug in because uh, we've just run the first two groups through and this system has been absolutely flawless. I mean, it's, it's really worked well and uh, they've been excellent to work with. So but I'm gonna let Allison answer that question. Okay, so specifically you wanna know what we're doing with the cattle? Do they stay in the pen? Do they stay in the pen? You know what, we'd really like to do that. And so what we found is we found we don't know a lot about sick cattle. First off, are we pulling cattle correctly? So when we actually do get them, we kind of want monitor them a bit and we want to get to the point where we never have to pull cattle out of the pen. So that's the direction we're headed. Okay. Do they contaminate the rest of the herd? Well, you see, that's a, that's a good question, isn't it? Yeah. That's a good question. So what are we pulling cattle for? Like today, I will tell you that right now we pull cattle and we basically think that all the cattle we pull that we treat are the sick cattle. But are we really identifying disease well? So you've asked a really good question. So there's lots of different kinds of diseases. So this isn't as simple as we thought. And uh, I think we're going to be at this for a number of years. Does anybody on the panel think there will be a standard moving forward in the future? There's residual feed intake, residual gain, and uh, feed to gain. We're, we're, we look at a lot of different numbers here. Do, do we think the industry will develop a standard and run with it? I think everyone should go to the Beef Improvement Federation meeting <laughs> at the University of Nebraska and we, definitely... We appreciate the sponsorship. <laughs> yes. Matt will take your um, enrollment check tonight. But that is really the beef industry performance body that creates such standardization. And that's a very intuitive question that um, I think really needs to be taken to the BIF for some degree of industry standardization. Matt or Allison, did you want to speak to that? I'd make a couple of comments to that. So I, that's a good question. I, I think BIF and, and uh, entities like that can provide recommendations relative to, to what may be ideal going forward. 
But at the end of the day, with everything else that moves into national cattle evaluation, the decision is very breed specific, and it's made by a board of directors by the respective breed. And, and we, for a lot of things, we don't see consistency between breeds in approaches. It would be nice. A way around that would, quite frankly, be the merger of, of some uh, genetic evaluations across breeds to help with that consistency. But the, the question you ask is not a scientific one. It unfortunately is very much a political one. Well, my predict we'll see we'll see different things going forward across breeds. We'll see things ranging from residual average daily gain, indexes of different forms and fashions, um, and and RFI as well. There, there's going to be differences across breeds. Here here's the wolf cattle answer, okay, <laughs> to that question. Um, this is what I told Kent in our email exchange the other day as he was putting his presentation together. I said, till the industry gets it sorted out, we understand feed to gain. We look at it on every pen of cattle we close out. So when Matt told me he was going to do a feed to gain EPD, I got real excited. Um, we'll see where the industry goes with it. BIF is Beef Improvement Federation. I've had the opportunity to attend those meetings uh, fairly often, and if, if you're like me and you want to challenge your brain and uh, meet some very smart people that understand genetics and try and figure it all out, and along with some other fellow cattle producers, uh, top-notch cattle producers, it's a good place to go to, so I encourage you to go to Lincoln. I guess I was going to address the question from maybe an out perspective. We had talked about this just before the meeting, to tell you the truth. And uh, I think an index approach is what, uh, even being on the BIF board, on the Feed Efficiency Project Advisory Board, that's kind of what we're looking at. The question is whether we incorporate that as a single feed efficiency index, or whether you include that in your other existing index, like say for Lindsay, the uh, mainstream terminal index, or for Angus, I mean they've got six indexes, so I'm not sure where they're going to stick it. But, <laughs> And then, also, I guess I've got a question to go with it, if that's all right. Yep, go ahead. Um, we address feed efficiency in a feedlot standard of feedlot spot, because truthfully, that's the easiest place to measure. And I know Allison's done some work with cow efficiency, and, and maybe just a question as to how those feed-to-gain measures relate to cow efficiency for these guys keeping replacements, or even the bulls that are turning out and how efficient they are and the body conditions for they can stay in to be more effective breeding. Okay, Joe, I want, I want number 24 and 25 together. I want that RFI and I want that gain. So what we're, what we're trying to look at is efficiency for the cow herd has a bit of a difference from what it has in the feedlot. If you don't have a calf on the ground, you're not all that efficient. So there's lots of factors that play in, and we don't look at data quite the same way as you all do. We look at it and then we try to see all the profitability and everything. What we know so far is that residual feed intake, I kind of talk about that. I'm not sure I fully understand residual average daily gain, but I do understand residual feed intake. So the way we look at it is we look at what are the efficiency factors, what are we taking a look at? And on RFI, we've been testing heifers, we've been taking cattle from every different segment and testing it through. So far that we see is RFI is holding through into the cow herd. But there's lots of other factors we have to include. So I don't think we have the most perfect maternal index yet, and I think we have to work on that. So I'm gonna use those two ranches over there. They've been buying bulls from us for a long time. Wayne Hepper and Dave Meyer from North Dakota. There's several thousand cows there represented. So hopefully someday we can come and look at the, the bulls they bought, the genetic makeup of that calf crop, and then track those calves back through the feed yard and validate the information that we're giving them as a selection tool back through our calves that run through the feed yard. See, is make sure I got the question right. Do we see the standard being a, a choice two over a choice three or what? How? Well, let's go back to what Jerry said about filling up those feed yards and buying all kinds of cattle all over. And what he didn't tell you is after we got done feeding them $8 corn and 
they weren't as efficient as the limousine. He asked me if I got that out of my system yet. <laughs> <laughs> and after looking at those closeouts, I said, yes, let's move on. <laughs> but so what we, watching our closeouts and watching our quality grades, I mean, we don't think we get paid enough for the quality that there is, and it costs a lot to put on. So leanness has more value in feed conversion, and it, I think quality is maybe a titch overrated, but we do need to stay above that, like our targets of the 80, 85% choice. You start bumping into that 90, 100, it's great, but more than likely you're losing out because fat is expensive to put on, lean meat is much more efficient to gain in the feed yard. So, I mean, that's, I don't want everybody to go breeding all the quality out of their cattle and we're, can't get our cattle sold to Tyson because they're not grading, but I don't think we need to be chasing 100% choice and 10% primes if we can, when I know if we're, our cattle are performing, it's when Tyson's calling me saying, hey, you need to get your grade up. I'm like, okay, they're limousines. We'll feed them 30 days longer. They're still gonna be efficient and they're converting and we're making money and we're just getting over that 80, 85% choice. So yeah, I mean, I think if we can get them to be choice twos, that'd be great. And, and that's what we're basically trying to do. Good question, Kevin. To paraphrase your question, when in the future might we get to the point where we don't need more phenotypes and we can lean more heavily on genomics? My short answer would be never. We're going to always need a steady flow of phenotypes from as many different traits as you want measured flowing into the system. Because even though we might be able to initially train a dense panel of markers to be informative, as you all select for different things and um, as we want to characterize the nooks and the crannies of the population as well as the mainstream mammals, we're going to always, at least based on today's technology, need a steady, if not ever increasing flow of phenotypes and good grouping data. For my money, for the foreseeable future, we still need the flow of phenotypes. Matt? So, so I agree. I, I think that the bigger decision point is, is Within a breed, when have we collected enough to pull the trigger, develop a genomic predictor that we feel comfortable spreading across the breed for animals that aren't phenotyped? Um, and I think for some breeds, we're at that point now. We, we could actually do that. On a within breed basis, breeds have to make an upfront investment to collect that data to get to that critical threshold. For feed intake, my concern to be real frank is, is that the largest benefactors, and it's, it, it's the way it should be, the largest benefactors are those that collected the data. A genomic test is going to predict their cattle better because those are the cattle that went into training. As we try to apply that genomic test across a larger population, we need to be a bit cognizant of that. Yeah, uh, Jim made the point that, um, and we do, we, even in our own operation, we bring a lot of 9 to 950 weight stockers off of grass in the fall that really haven't been fed any grain. And then they get 120 days grain and, and go to town. So yeah, that is how we will definitely grass helps the beef industry compete. You know, I don't know if this is a point of discussion with my good friend Matt Spangler or not, but as he mentioned, used an example of of how limousine can fix dairy cows in, in complementary crossbreeding. We like to think, still think they're, and always have, they're the, the best cross on Angus cows. I, I just had something I wanted to add. I was sitting over here telling Dan a story and he says, get up there and tell it, get up there and tell it. So I was telling Allison too, it was probably 10, 12 years ago, I heard Mark Gardner speaking and he was talking about five by five cattle. And at that time, and I'm, I don't know, I hope my geneticists back me up here, but at that time, um, that was like a pipe dream. I mean, we were talking about seven to one conversion rates. 
on Gattle that were gaining four pounds a day. So the bulls that, uh, that Kent had up on the screen there, I mean, we had several bulls that were just real close to that. He actually gained a little more than five pounds a day. Um, so the other slide he had was showed that we hadn't made a lot of uh, gain as an industry towards feed efficiency. But there are breeders that are doing it and they're doing it well. We just haven't done a real good job of propagating it. So when you take out all the cattle that are getting, you know, getting shown and looked apart and, and syndicated and everything else, and we cut through all that and we, we realize that our job is to produce food and we get, we get nailing it down to these numbers, that's when we can start making a, a difference in the industry.